So I've been doing loads of testing with the V6 CNC scroll saw and this video is going to be a bit of a mishmash on things that have improved it and things I've had to fix along the way. Here are some of the first cuts with the saw mounted on the backing plate and the rotary guides and a new motor mount that holds it more securely. And here you can see a little foot that is supposed to hold the workpiece from moving up on the upstroke, which is just the same as other scroll saws have. But this one's not actually applying much downforce. It's just there to prevent large movements on the upstroke. and some early testing doing cornering to see how well it could cut 90 degree turns which actually looks pretty good considering how early on this was but I noticed that the motor seemed to be running twice as fast as I thought it was and so I was comparing what the motor controller thought it was running at with what an Arduino was measuring the elapsed time with that photo interrupter and it was running twice as fast because I had the pole pairs setting wrong I had four pole pairs which would actually be eight poles but I only have a two pole pair motor or four poles pole pairs and poles is pretty confusing so I got that fixed and then it was running at the expected speed of 4 hertz when it said 4 hertz. But then the software wasn't saving my acceleration profiles and so I had to reverse engineer the file format by trying 64 different configuration files to figure out which bytes went where and then I could write that configuration file directly. And so I automated loading and showing those so I could just pick it out of the right image. And then it was a matter of doing some accuracy testing where these two lines should meet perfectly in the center cutting from one side to the other but they don't. And so here is a list of all the things that could and do contribute to the cutting accuracy of this saw. And blade drift is a term that gets thrown around in regards to both scroll saws and band saws, both the really big logging ones and the smaller ones. There's some good papers out there. And some of the things don't really apply to the size of blade that I'm using. And then there's some additional things like the concentricity of the blade when it rotates that I needed to account for. One thing that I thought might help would be to only feed forward when the saw blade was moving down. And now that I've moved to this continuous running saw instead of a stepper motor, I needed a way to trigger the movement to wait until the saw was at the top dead center. And so here was some testing, which is in my last video too, showing how that works. And this turned out to be not that helpful and much harder to do at higher motor speeds. One major factor that I've identified is the blade selection, specifically the tooth set. Not all scroll saw blades actually have a set where the teeth are pushed side to side and the ones that are not set tend to have a unidirectional set just because of the way that they're manufactured and end up drifting a significant amount. And so I'm pretty much sticking with the Pegas modified geometry. I also wanted to measure the blade tension on the saw to see if my clamps were strong enough to hold a blade at its max tension. And so I did some weight loading with various blades and measured their frequency 
when plucking them to then be able to compare when they're mounted on the saw. And so there's one of the blades breaking at around. Most of them were like 25 pounds, plus or minus five, something like that. The next challenge was to align the axes so that they fed parallel and directly into the blade because even if the blade was perfect and didn't drift, then it could still look like it was drifting if you were feeding off axis. And so the most reliable way I found to do this was to just take a horizontal cut off of a piece of wood and then sweep it with a dial indicator to measure the angle that you cut. And this is still a bit complicated because as you progress through the cut, the amount of restoring force that the wood can provide changes because, you know, it's holding on by less and less. So if the blade is flexing, then you might end up with a, a curve going down or out, depending. So this still isn't perfect, but it did help me get there eventually. And this is actually the last and most successful test after many, many tests where the run out, so to speak, is only around uh, three or four thou across the about 55 millimeter width, which is pretty good. And so the way I would run these tests is make a cut and then measure and then I can calculate the angle that I need to move the rotary axis by. And then repeat the cut and see how it went. And the issue I was running into is that this process was sporadic. And I accepted on some level that there was going to be a bit of uh, variation but it was way more than was really usable. And so the culprit came down to the resolution I could achieve with my rotary axis. And this came from, came partly from the single bearings I was using to drive the square shaft. And these had enough radial play that they would just slip around for angles less than about a degree, which is was necessary to get it aligned properly. And the way I measured this was mounting a mirror or hard drive platter on the square shaft and then bouncing a laser to another wall to be able to measure the small angular changes. And here is a homing test that I could do. And I also had step tests of certain degrees in one direction and another direction, and I could also check the backlash. And this is what let me finally discover that the bearings were the culprit. And so the fix was to replace them with V wheels, just like on the other rolling axes, which have two bearings, and that's mounted on a shaft, and it allows me to have a adjustable preload and remove the hacky blue painters tape because the wheels are plastic now instead of metal. And I also increased the gear ratio from 4 to 12 and linked the two rotary axes with a drive shaft so that the stepper motors couldn't be an issue. And with all that implemented, here I'm showing the marks from moving in 0.05 degree steps, which look very consistent. And then here I'm stepping in 0.01 degrees between them. And things look good with very low backlash. And here they are running. They look just the same, but it's a bit of a better view of what they look like. And you can see I have a dust problem. And so with the axes better aligned, and switching to a top and bottom table, 
as you can see there, those two aluminum L profiles, which is similar to how I've had it before. I tried cutting some more puzzle shapes. And the shorter table actually also makes it easier to pull the piece out once it's finished cutting. And the results were looking pretty good. I was doing these out of a 5-ply birch plywood, which is a bit harder than what I was using before. And that cut a little better, actually. And that's the earlier one out of softer wood on the bottom. And the thing that really made a big difference was adding another top bolt to prevent the top piece from flexing. And there, after the bolt on the top, you can see some of the key areas that improved. And the lines meet up where they should, and everything is starting to really look good. I then turned my attention back to going faster, because faster is always better. And to do that, I needed to add a larger flywheel to the motor. And so here I have a flywheel that I got laser cut and mounting it to a hub onto the motor and that also acts as the crank arm and reprinting a stronger connecting rod and here are some speed tests And I added some HDPE to the table to slide easier and have enclosed the moving parts to make it a bit quieter. And then the dust collector sticks out the back so the smaller box helps the dust move back there and got everything mounted up. There's that dust collector port. And then here's a quick look at a harder cornering test that I did. And I think this is running at 6 hertz, which is pretty comfortable and gives a good speed up over 4 hertz. And so this piece just shows a 90 degree, a 45, and a 135 degree cut on a single piece. And you can see this came out looking really clean. Just a tiny bit of a radius on that 45 degree turn. And it lines up with the shape from the computer very well. And then on the software side, I have a better puzzle generator to make bigger puzzles. And then the G-code generator needed a lot of work to be able to cope with these bigger puzzles. And something that I've realized way too late into this whole process is that I can use foam board to do test cuts and it cuts easily 20 times faster than the plywood. So that will probably be in the next video. So stay tuned and hopefully we'll see you all soon.